Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Willis, and I am a member of Open Nurses. And I'm happy today to be welcoming you all to our very first broadcast of a conversation and interview with a psychedelic nurse luminary or ally in the field of psychedelic assisted therapies and medicine. Today, our amazing guest is Karen Cooper. And I'll uh, introduce her very shortly. I'd like to start our broadcast today by introducing myself and having each of you in the audience uh, introduce yourselves as well. Let us know who you are, where you're coming from, what kind of nursing you do, or if you have any comments. Throughout the conversation today, feel free to put in questions, but always be mindful to be respectful, professional, compassionate, and kind at all times. And uh, we welcome any ideas for future broadcasts and know that this is a brand new organization. My colleagues, Andrew Penn, Wendy Marusich, and Angela Ward, and myself, Liz Willis, have been working on creating for the past year. Our vision that we're hoping to crystallize along with the help of each one of you is to help advance the field of nursing and uh, kind of empower us, educate us, and support one another. I think that together we could all crystallize an incredible vision and make all of our dreams come true. Nurses are uniquely poised to be a um, really powerful presence in psychedelic medicine therapies and harm reduction. So I want to um, welcome you all to be a part of our group as we grow. Thank you for your presence here today, or if you're a future viewer. And a little bit more about myself. I'm an ER nurse in the Bay Area in California. I've been in the ER for almost a decade, and I'll now be transitioning to psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. I'm a recent graduate of UCSF's really great program and a Master of Science degree. I met Andrew, Wendy, and Angela during the CIAS, California Institute of Integral Studies Certificate in Psychedelic Therapies and Research Program. So we together have created this group for you all and for ourselves because we saw a great need um, to help educate, train, certify, organize, and just really um, uplift nursing. We all believe um, we have so much to offer the realm of psychedelic medicines and therapies. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Karen Cooper. And I first met Karen also through the CIS program. She presented to our cohort on mindfulness and self-care. And this was really important because as many of us have learned over the past year with COVID, we have to learn how to care for ourselves. And also, as a guide or a person who is sharing these experiences with our guests in, in the medicine realm, we really need to learn how to cultivate a strong presence um, and really tend to ourselves. And so, um, it's an honor to have her here. I'm going to read her bio to you because I think it's, it's so perfect. So Karen Cooper, she's an RNVSN with an MA. She's been a sub-investigator in therapy diet and project manager at the Fort Collins MAP study site since 2016. She was the lead guide and clinical research nurse for the University of Wisconsin Psilocybin Pharmacokinetic Study and served as a study trainer for USONA Institute in Madison, Wisconsin from 2013 to 2016. She has served in various capacities for the Center for Psychedelic Therapies and Research at CIS, including mentor, guest faculty, admissions and advisor. She's helped to launch their inaugural program and I would like to add, she graciously offered to be my mentor and that to many other nurses and students. Karen's master's degree in holistic health education at John F. Kennedy University included a focus on transpersonal and somatic psychology. She's a licensed body worker and massage therapist. She's certified as a yoga teacher, Reiki and Jin Shin Jiu Jitsu practitioner. I don't know if I said that correctly. And a public health nurse. Some say she was a wise woman a medicine woman or a healer, but she self-describes as a guide helping others to navigate their inner terrain towards cultivating acceptance and tenderness towards self and others. She offers consultation, mentoring, and coaching in private practice to those curious investigating guiding in the research setting or finding meaning from psychedelic and alternate reality experiences. 
Karen's nursing career spans more than 30 years in acute community clinic research business and academic environments serving patients and clients from prenatal to end of life. She has supported her love for teaching, science, consciousness, psychology, psychedelics, and spirituality, and combined them beautifully. Her outside interests include gardening, fiber arts, painting, cooking, and exploring the natural beauty and outdoor activities near her home in Northern Colorado, where she lives with her husband, Dan Mueller, and their pup, Zev. We might get to hear from Zev later today. So, Karen, thank you so much for being here. I'm very grateful. Welcome. I'd like to ask for you to tell us about your nursing career and the trajectory and arc to where you are in psychedelic medicine now. Thank you so much, Liz. And I'll just apologize in advance to the audience if you do hear my puppy unexpectedly. I don't have a puppy sitter, but um, he's entertaining. So you might hear him in the background. And I'd actually like to start, if you don't mind, the way that I start many of our um, sessions in the research setting with study participants, which is with just a, a brief centering gathering moment or two. And um, you can have your eyes open or closed. This is something that helps me to be more fully present with you all um, in the audience. And just taking a moment with the breath sounds of the environment, pleasant or unpleasant, expected, unexpected, knowing that all of us, nurses and others listening, are here for a common cause, which is in support of healing, healing anxiety, answering questions, providing kindness to others, and each other as well as our own selves. And knowing even virtually, we are all connected in one right here, right now. And let's just take one deep breath together, inhaling to the count of four and letting go on the exhale. And if your eyes are closed, you can open them whenever you're ready. So thank you so much for that little centering exercise. That's really helpful for me. And uh, I'll get to Liz's question of my, um, I think, nursing career trajectory. Um, I became a nurse in 1986 and actually did not want to become a nurse. I had been a childbirth educator and a lay midwife. And after my own childbirth experience, which felt kind of dehumanizing, um, I thought, I want to help teach others about, I was, became an, so interested in how the body worked, the anatomy and the physiology and nutrition. And um, was a lay midwife. I studied with an empirical midwifery group uh, when I lived in California in the Bay Area where I was raised. And then at some point, um, some friends got busted, not by the parents, but um, by district attorney, some midwife friends, um, for doing home births. And so um, I felt at that time, I was a single mother of two children, got divorced, and thought I, I need to support myself, and I, I really can't afford to have somebody show up at my door with guns and raiding my house like had happened to one of my colleagues. And so nursing seemed to be uh, an avenue to become a certified nurse midwife. Um, nursing school was very difficult for me on many levels because it, it, it felt rigid. And this is back in 1984, 1986. And um, very, um, very much not, not so, the people were called patients, but uh, we required them to be patient for a lot of things that just felt to me like it was very disconnecting while I was providing work, even in nursing school. And um, I decided then I didn't wanna go this nurse midwifery route, but that becoming a registered nurse would open up many doors for me, many opportunities as well as uh, financial, um, that um, there's so many transferable skills. And so I, I got my uh, associate in science degree 
and then transferred directly with scholarships to a bachelor's level and learned about research. And that was so fascinating for me. And um, I had decided somewhere, I, I had been a preschool teacher, loved working with children. And for some reason, something intuitive said, you know, I, I want to go into neonatal intensive care. That technology fa fascinated me, the um, field development fascinated me. And there was a preceptorship program. And my advisor said, oh, you know, you're new, you're, you won't be able to get that. Um, but a former student called up that week and said, you know, I'm working in neonatal intensive care. This is at San Francisco Children's Hospital. I went to San Francisco State. And I'd love to mentor a student because I didn't get that. And so synchronistically, um, I had a six month preceptorship um, with this wonderful teacher who uh, needed to work with a student um, in order to get her advanced nurse practice um, uh, uh, licensure there or certification at the hospital. And um, there was so much technology. And um, I at some point thought, what am I doing here? And I met a woman who had been a midwife in Thailand who was the expert IV nurse in the NICU. And so I asked her, I said, well, you are a midwife, like, why are you here? And she said, you know, it's not any different. You know, in childbirth, I'm there with a woman in the family and I'm there as her advocate and to allow things to unfold. And here, I'm here with this little um, baby and their family and doing the technical things to help heal and, and grow um, this fetus or this baby and to protect the family. And I loved that. And that has been a carrying theme for me. And I, I went on um, to work at Children's Hospital in Oakland, three years in the NICU and then three years in the community as an infant development nurse working with uh, families, doing home visits in parts of Richmond and Oakland, California, where uh, many people said was too dangerous to go. But I had a great team that I worked with at the follow-up department there and learned so much from those patients. And again, really needing to be present with where people were at and um, allowing things to unfold and guiding them along um, to better health. And um, really loved that. I was curious about whether I could have my own practice as a nurse. And um, so I thought, well, I want to learn about business. So I worked in the business world for about seven years as a clinical nurse consultant and have since worked in the clinic setting, um, gosh, public health. Um, I'm now an advice nurse part time and um, have worked at different kind of project oriented uh, positions at the University of Wisconsin when I lived in Madison for 12 years. And that's where I was introduced or was invited into the psychedelic research realm. Um, so today, I just wanna let people know, I am not a licensed psychotherapist. I'm not a mental health nurse practitioner. I'm an RN. Um, as Liz mentioned, my master's is in holistic health education. And because I'd already been a teacher, a licensed uh, adult ed teacher, I did not have to take those components of the program. I took other components, which were primarily transpersonal and somatic psychology. That was kind of a minor for me. And that opened up lots of possibilities and uh, realms about the mind and introduced me to meditation. And um, those have been really good tools for me. Thank you, Karen. And I want to let all of you know this is our first broadcast, so please be patient with any technical difficulties. And we're getting to know um, everything, so thank you. I want to ask you the next question I have for you. And this is um, important to each of us, and we each bring a different individual perspective to psychedelic therapy work. So what do you think about that idea? What can nurses bring to the table with psychedelic medicine? Or what have you learned that might be some of the skills or talents or intuitive things that you know about being with someone in a time of transition or when they're reliving a trauma or in a difficult experience? What could nurses bring to the table? 
I think nurses have uh, tremendous abilities that will contribute to this field. Um, we, we are very aware of, of the environment and you might call it therapeutic milieu. And we have to be, you have to pay attention to who's coming into the room and what procedures need to be done and timing, medications, um, the mental health um, status of your patient and their visitors, um, and also deal with administrative responsibilities and scheduling. So we're kind of multitaskers, but in the midst of that busyness, uh, I think many of us come into the field because we care about people. We're a trust, the most trusted profession. People listen to us because we are there, we spend time with them. And that is one thing that I think is so important is learning to be more fully present with yourself. Um, so what I mean by that is um, you're aware of what's happening in your breath, in your body, your movements. You're also um, observing. We, we do assessments all the time. And so we observe, it might be breathing rate, body language, um, the type of words that people use, um, signals of, of anxiety or distress. And we're taking all of this in all the time. It's sort of automatic and part of it's through our training. And that's so important, working with people who are in an altered state, I would say. And it could be from psychedelic medicines, but it could also be um, from some other state of mind caused by medications, for example, or even an out-of-body experience, um, near-death experience, or returning from that. So we're able to observe all the things in the environment and make adjustments. And we notice things. I found um, working with, with other um, people, therapists in the research setting, that I would notice that, um, gosh, that uh, plant that was in the room is not there anymore. And our study participant would come in and say, what happened to the plant? You know, and so uh, it was very important to them to have um, a growing live plant in the room. Um, and other things, um, oh, like equipment, uh, clinical equipment that might be for, you know, maybe emergency use or something and putting that behind a curtain. Uh, so these little nuances make such a difference in what we call the setting or the environment. And nurses um, observe these things all of the time. If there's a lot of clutter, it's hard for people to breathe and relax because they're always, you know, paying attention to a variety of things. And we often have these very um, cluttered environments with, with equipment, but have learned, oh, maybe it's um, helpful to have the blood pressure machine a little farther away from the patient's face. So it's not, the little alarm goes off, it's not quite, quite as loud, things like that. Those sensitivities that we've developed, some of them are intuitive, some are through training and experience, uh, really can make a, a big difference to somebody in the, uh, under the influence of a, a psychedelic or even um, MDMA. What was the rest of your question, Liz? Uh, what else nurses Yeah, bring? what you thought nurses could bring to this field. Yeah, yeah, I think you've answered it very well so far, but tell me if there's more. Yeah, one thing I would like to mention in the therapeutic milieu, um, I, I do, I like the term guide um, or facilitator or guide therapist. Um, all the, the dyad partners that I've had in the MAP studies are all uh, psychotherapists. And as a nurse, I bring something different. One thing is if somebody is physiologically having some issues, I know how to deal with that. And we have never had to use any emergency medications, but they are available. I know where they are. I, I know what the doses are. I know what the side effects are. Um, and if I were to need to offer, I don't know, volume to somebody that was high, hyper anxious, um, I would have confidence to say, you know, this will help you to breathe rather than just take this pill. But here's why. Would you like me to breathe with you or would you like to take this tablet? Um, and if there is a medical emergency that's unforeseen, and it might not be on medicine day, sometimes, you know, these things happen uh, to people in life. Um, heart attack, for example, some cardiac arrest. I, I would, I know how to use the AED and do CPR and, and I know what the timing is and can stay calm in the midst of that. And that kind of preparation is really helpful when you have other unexpected things like 
somebody bursting into the room uh, during a, a psychotherapy session or um, just having that assuredness is so helpful um, for study participants is what they've told me. And then I have a little bit of a different perspective. I'm not diagnosis driven. I don't think about this person as being access to or um, having a personality disorder. Um, they, they might come into a study because there's a diagnosis like PTSD or depression, but I'm looking at them as a, a whole human being and um, all that that involves. Trusting that um, whatever presents itself in our relationship and that this person shares in the space that we're in together, uh, trusting that that's being um, presented to be witnessed so that it can be healed. And I believe in the healing power. I've seen amazing things with the human body. And um, so now uh, is an opportunity to work more with the mind and with consciousness and the healing capabilities there. Wonderful. I appreciate that. While we're on the subject of these sessions, um, people wanted to know, how do you care for yourself during them and maybe after or before? What steps are you taking to be this solid presence, presence that people trust? Um, similar to my bodywork practice, um, I take uh, maybe it might even only be one to three minutes or it could be 10 minutes or longer, depending on how much time I have to take a breath like we did at the, the beginning of um, the opening here. Um, it might just be, um, for example, as a massage therapist and body worker, um, uh, before I put my hand on the door or the person's you know, getting on the table, uh, I would just stop and um, say maybe a mantra, something like, you know, their energy is their energy and mine is mine and we will work together. Um, it might be uh, take a breath and let go of whatever just happened and be present. Um, and I often did this as a nurse. If I was assigned to a patient that was quote difficult or that I had maybe had an interaction with that um, was, was um, unpleasant, um, I wanted to come back into the room fresh. And so taking a breath is really helpful. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it sounds kind of trite, but it actually does work. We know that it works with your uh, parasympathetic nervous system to tone things down. And so that's often what I do before I start a session. During the session, I often will get into a meditative state. And it's a bit different for a preparation or integration session compared to um, a treatment session with the medicine on board. Uh, because of the length of time. We usually have 90 minutes for preparation and integration sessions and an eight hour day with the person on medicine day. So um, the timing and procedures that we need to do change throughout the day, but I, I check in with myself. So I have noticed that um, over time and through a lot of my own work that sometimes I'm, I'm an empath. And if I feel my heart rate increasing, but I'm, I've been relaxed, it's probably happening with them. And I know that this is true because I've checked it out <laughs> verbally with people. You know, how are you feeling? Is your you know, uh, heart rate slow, fast, or usual? <laughs> and oh yeah, my heart rate is going really fast. So, oh, well, it's not me. <laughs> um, if, if I'm, uh, and some of you may have experienced this yourself, if it seems really odd that all of a sudden I'm overwhelmed with sadness, I may be taking the energy on from somebody else. And so, I'll stop and notice and go, oh, okay, I can, that's there and I can let it pass through me. So not holding on to um, thoughts, body sensations, or something unusual that, that might be occurring within my own psyche or my body. Um, and reminding myself uh, that acronym WAIT, why am I talking? So uh, to be a better listener, uh, sometimes somebody will be on the brink of an insight or maybe they're sharing something and I just feel like, oh, I just want to share something more with them. Um, I'll count to 20 or 30 and um, wait until the, la the last person has spoken and then count. Sometimes it's only to 10, but I will count and allow that spaciousness of silence to be there. I tend to be very talkative. 
I'm a extrovert or, you know, outward processor, verbal processor, but there are other people who um, are processing, thinking very thoughtfully and slower. And I want to allow them the time uh, before I speak, allow them the time to be silent and enjoy that or to give thought before they share something. That's been very valuable, but I will say that if you are working with a therapy partner uh, who doesn't, um, isn't comfortable with silence or doesn't know that this is part of how you work, they may um, get upset. I did have one partner that said, I felt like you weren't, you know, you were so quiet. I wanted to know what was going on. <laughs> so it's good to communicate in advance. I consider that part of self-care uh, when I work with a dyad um, therapist. And then afterwards, oh, oh, and then sometimes, especially on medicine day, if I begin to have worry or tension in my body or uh, get confused about something, I'll take a bathroom break or say I'm taking a bathroom break and I'll use water. I wash my hands and just like let any of that worry or tension go down the drain um, and allow the kind of rejuvenating properties of water, um, you know, think about that and come back in fresh. I do exercise, um, try to take a, at least five or 10 minute walk outside before going into sessions. And if I don't do that at home, um, do something cardio, I, I believe that meditation is a very essential tool. Whatever form that it takes, whether you have a walking meditation or a sitting meditation, to really develop a regular practice. And often we'll get into a meditative state when I'm there with um, study participants. And that allows me to just uh, be have an open heart and to not be overthinking things, but de to be aware that if an intervention is needed, or if a strong intuition comes up, then I can check out, is this transference or counter transference? Am I projecting my own stuff onto that person? For example, gee, they look so uncomfortable, I should go give them a pillow um, and I'll wait. And maybe they just grab the pillow themselves or I'll say, gee, would you like a pillow? And they're, oh no, I'm fine. <laughs> so that's part of the, the self-care, separating what's my stuff from others. And um, afterwards, debriefing um, with anybody. If, if I were, I haven't I had the opportunity to work by myself because study protocols um, don't, um, haven't been put into place for that yet. But um, I think a, a good practice would be to sort of have a nonverbal processing after a session. So I will do this part on my own. And by that, I mean um, artwork. It can be newsprint and color crayons. It can be paint. It can be, um, I'm a fiber artist, so it might spin yarn. And just to let thoughts unfold themselves and maybe journal. But I think the nonverbal part without words, just could be a scribble or a symbol, can often be uh, revealing later on. Yeah. Well, that was a really just thorough and... Um important um, lot of information that I think I'll definitely take to heart. Thank you. And some of it sounds almost different than nursing. So taking a step back and um, changing some things about the way we've been taught to practice in this particular realm. And um, one thing I want to know, Karen, what advice would you give to the nurses in the audience that are interested in pursuing the field of psychedelic medicine or therapy or research or harm reduction or advocacy? Yeah, I get asked this question quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are so many possibilities and where we're at right now with psychedelics and legalization, things are shifting. And um, I feel that I need to protect my license and my livelihood. So um, I'm involved only in legal psychedelic therapies, but um, I do think that um, there are some things that you can do um, as an RN. If you wanna go into research, you need to have at least your bachelor's degree. Um, at any academic institution and most places that have study protocols, they're gonna require a bachelor's degree. So mm -hmm. that's uh, one thing. And 
It can be um, in nursing, or if you have your associate degree, maybe it's psychology or some other interest. They, the academic institutions usually will, their human resources departments will say bachelor's degree, but they don't necessarily require it to be in nursing. Um, so find something that you're interested in and develop expertise in it. It might be accounting. Maybe you like working with numbers. Um, and then you take what you have developed that expertise in and apply it. Use your imagination or look around and, and do some research on what is needed in the psychedelic field. So you might be um, starting out maybe in a supportive role, um, helping finances for a sponsor. Um, perhaps your forte is not numbers, but it's really um, like in my case, I was a yoga teacher and a meditator. And so I had worked with people primarily with, with cancer for the yoga therapy and yoga teaching. And so, you know, those skills have been very transferable. In fact, helped me to get my um, first job uh, with USONA because it required organizational skills. It required um, an understanding of consciousness and, and also um, the body. And um, being able to be with people when something cathartic came up. And mm -hmm. so um, that I think is, is something that we can do. If you're interested in law, there's lots of support that's gonna be need, needed in the legal arena. And if you're a nurse and interested in law, oh my gosh, you, you're a trusted person, you have attention to detail, and um, you have an understanding of what it's like to be uh, the patient and work in the healthcare system that needs to be changed. So you can help create those changes, uh, particularly you know, in mental health. Um, so developing some expertise and then transferring your skills. And then the other is, I would say, collaboration. Uh, I guess in the good old days, we would call it networking. But I don't mean in just the sense of sharing a business card or trying to get into business with somebody, but really collaborating with others, like in the open group. Um, you start talking with others and finding out what their ideas are. I, every opportunity that I get, I would ask somebody, you know, what do you find most challenging about the role that you're in? And what do you find to be the most rewarding? And then think to myself, you know, gee, like maybe that challenge would be too much for me or not very interesting. Um, but just to ask some questions like that to people that you meet and then to let go. You can have a, an intention. For example, many people say, oh, I want to be a guide. How do I become a guide? How do I get into research? And um, you can have that intention and move, take steps to move towards it but then to let go of the outcome and allow whatever the universe is offering you to unfold. And it might be that um, something unexpected happens that you didn't even know was going to happen, but you were open and ready for it. And it, then it's in alignment with your intention. So um, what else? I think learning about the research is important at this point because that's where our society is at. And um, that's uh, less less fearful for people uh, to have some evidence there for many people that are afraid of psychedelics or have been um, in this culture of the you know, war against drugs um, and heard negative things um, about psychedelics that um, if you can look at some of the research and then provide them with education. So that's part of harm reduction. Nurses are great educators and teachers in general and um, harm reduction, you know, allowing the person to receive information so that they can make an informed choice, just like we have them, you know, sign for surgery is supposed to be an informed choice. Um, we want to be able to give them, you know, the information, the risks and the benefits. And nurses are very good at that. You can develop assessment techniques. I think there's lots of things that you can do as nurses. I just saw a podcast um, recently that was about psychedelics and dying, death and dying. And uh, oh, I'm blanking on her last name, Lady Bird. I'll get it later. And then uh, uh, Maria um, Mangini are both nurses. And they were on that podcast. And um, mm. Lady Bird has created a hospice program uh, for prisoners. Um, mm. And Maria's background is in midwifery. So 
two very different um, environments that they work in, uh, both nurses and um, have applied some things that they were able to do in their nursing career and transferred it over and are hoping to move into the psychedelic, these, these talents that they have um, and intentions um, to work with psychedelic therapies. Sounds like there's a world of opportunities and thank you for broadening uh, my yeah, perception of that. Yeah. If anybody in the uh, audience, you know, has ideas about that, please write them in. We'd love to see those. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, definitely, it is getting uh, pretty deep into the interview, so we should definitely take some audience questions. I just want to go back to one important thing. You mentioned protecting your license. Do you have anything else to add to that for newer nurses in the audience or those of us who really want to work in this field, but we are aware, we're keenly aware, that we do want to protect our license? And, um, be above the board in all things. Um, any recommendations for or against being open to this topic? I guess it, it depends on each individual's risk tolerance. Um, and um, just to know that there's a lot of positive press, but right now uh, the drugs are schedule one. So um, there's a few exceptions in certain areas, but I'm talking about the United States. So um, you do have a, a risk if you do illegal therapies. And I'll just share something with you um, that there's at least three people that I know of who were licensed uh, therapists, but this could certainly happen to an RN as well, serving in a guide role. And um, they had clients who they knew and trusted. And um, one had a friend who was very depressed and said, um, you know, I know that you've had this training um, and so, uh, could you help my friend do an MDMA session? Mm -hmm. And the therapist uh, interviewed, screened the person, seemed like she was really suffering, um, and agreed to do um, a session. Session was great. This person, um, depression was lifted and continued with some psychotherapy a few times afterwards and felt so much better. So it was not the client that complained, but the client's partner their relationship dynamic had changed. And they said, I don't think this is good. You know, this, my partner was never this independent before, um, really is, is not capable of making decisions and uh, turn the therapist into the license board. So that could happen to you as an RN as well. Um, and so it just, if that doesn't matter to you, then, um, you know, you would have a, something on your record uh, and wouldn't be able to practice as an RN anymore. So that's something to, to, to consider. Um, I feel that it's just for me, I have an interest in the interface of science and spirituality or consciousness. So I, I like working in the research setting and with individuals. And I think there are many things that you can do in the legal realm. For example, if you were gonna have a psychedelic experience or you wanted to have some, um, experience working with people as a guide, uh, then go to a country where it's legal and apprentice with somebody, um, kind of do the background checks and get referrals and um, make sure that it's somebody that would be compatible with your values and what your intentions are, and then decide what you can take from that if you're gonna come back into the US um, into your practice. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and there's many things that uh, you can practice, for example, guided imagery. I have uh, been trained in, in interactive guided imagery, and I've used that many times during our what we think are the placebo sessions and also mm -hmm. to help prepare somebody for a journey. Um, listening to music play playlist with eye shades on and a head headphones, for example, um, you know, that is a new experience for some people and uh, just an inward experience like that um, can you can help guide them through that. So you can apply training from that's legal in other countries or your own experiences and share those. Um, I'm careful who I share with, and um, fortunately for for me, I had many psychedelic experiences um, starting at age 14, and they were recreational. They were not intended to lift my consciousness or be healing or um, to help me heal from a hurt, but it was more for partying. However, what happened was 
I began to have insights um, about some of my own personality and abilities. Um, and uh, so it, it expanded my consciousness, whether I had intended it to or not. Um, so I will share that with people because it's so long gone and um, was way before I was a nurse. Um, so sharing carefully and um, yeah, really thinking about the risk versus the benefits and noticing whether you are wanting to help somebody out of a, a caretaking mode um, to be a hero, uh, to be the one to help somebody heal, or if you're doing it out of a, a place of, of compassion, um, because if it's for yourself, and sometimes that's hard for us to see, if it's for mm -hmm. yourself, um, oftentimes things don't turn out well. All right. Those are some really great answers. I'm going to look here for some questions. Let's see. Um, the first one I've got for you here is uh, from Eric Mayer. Why are nurse roles mentioned in the current research with MAPS protocols? Not sure if you know the answer to that. Um, I, I don't know the exact um, answer to that, but I will say uh, with MAPS, you are not required to be a licensed psychotherapist. Rick Doblin, you know, wants to be a psychedelic therapist, and he is not a licensed uh, therapist himself. Um, there is a belief that, you know, there can be a whole range of people. Uh, the important thing is that, that they're trained so that we can help people navigate their inner terrain so that you have, you know, both a, a research background, a knowledge of the medicine, uh, how, how it works um, so that you can provide that informed consent um, to study participants. Mm -hmm. And then also um, that um, therapists sometimes have a, a certain modality that they're interested in. And um, in, the, in the MAPS protocols, it's a, different. We refer to it as a non-directive approach. So for example, we're not doing psychoanalysis. We're not doing... Um, uh, EMDR uh, for people with PTSD. Um, you're there um, trusting in that person's inner healing intelligence and allowing things to unfold. And so if you are really um, stuck on a certain modality, cognitive behavioral therapy only, um, that's not something that's going to work um, with this protocol and we think is not the most beneficial for people receiving the MDMA. Um, the other thing I wanted to say that, that I forgot to mention earlier about nurses is, I mean, we've been involved since very early If you uh, on in psychedelic um, research. If you take a look at some of the old pictures um, from the 50s and 60s, you see the nurses with the white caps and the dresses, and they're in there, like, I don't know, monitoring vital signs or something. But in actuality, talking with some of the therapists at the time, um, the nurses were the ones that were kind of like the guides. The, the doctor would come in with their white coat and administer the LSD or whatever the substance was. And then they'd leave and say, tell us if something's happening. Cause they didn't want to sit there for 12 hours with somebody. So nurses were there and we don't know much about what their experience was with those participants and what they did, but they were there. We were there. In 1997, Rick Strassman's um, DMT, like this pivotal study, um, it's IV, like people like skyrocketed up uh, into other atmospheres um, quickly. There was a nurse there to start that IV and be present. Um, and so nurses have been involved. Um, we know how to write protocols. I The other reason I got involved in the uh, psilocybin study at University of Wisconsin with USONA was that it was a, a phase one study. And so I wrote the clinical protocols for, you know, we had to do blood draws, blood pressure, EKG, urine samples. So we know the urine needs to be put on ice. Um, we know or we can learn where to put the EKG leads and why and what to do when they fall off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how to troubleshoot an IV when we're doing blood samples. So um, I trained other people to, to follow the protocol and um, all kinds of safety syringes, you know, um, therapists don't know about that. Um, teaching people how to give a, a blood pressure reading, get a blood pressure reading correctly, like uncross your legs, don't talk. You know, these are things we do all the time. So those can be very helpful 
for uh, to have a nurse that understands these things. And what do you do if you get a high blood pressure reading? Well, you know, you wait, you have them relax, you repeat. <laughs> when do you call the study physician? Uh, we, we know that just, you know, kind of automatically. We don't have to learn about it so much as, as other people do. I would like to see more nurses develop protocols. There are research nurses and you don't have to have your master's degree to write a protocol. Um, again, collaborating with other people can be very helpful. You might need somebody with a PhD to be on your team, um, but there are many things that you can offer as a consultant or um, other contributor to studies. So write yourself in. Yeah, and I think together we can all do that. Thank you for your encouragement. So this question is from Stacy Green. How do psychedelic medicines help people cope with the existential distress associated with the fear of dying? And have you personally seen relief for patients with life-limiting diagnoses? I'll answer the second half first. I, I would love to work in palliative care or um, uh, with people with an end, of li end of life or with terminal diagnosis, but I've not had that opportunity yet. And um, I was a pediatric hospice nurse for a while and have been, of course, as a nurse with um, many people of all ages at time of death. Um, so I think that there's great opportunity there. Um, and my own experience is birth and death for me, uh, it's just these, there's a door and I, I can be on either side of the door, whether it's life coming in or life going out. Um, as nurses, we are required to be with people during difficult times. And sometimes we are the one that gives them the bad, bad news about the state of their health or prognosis, or they get that shocking news and we come in and spend time with them um, just to, to describe what that might mean or to, to help them develop an understanding of what it might mean to them and their lives and their families. Um, and that psychedelic medicines, you know, they, they do, the studies have shown that they uh, help tremendously to cope with um, existential distress and end of life anxiety. And even people who were given a, a terminal diagnosis, uh, NYU did a study, they, they weren't at end of life. They might've been diagnosed with breast cancer and they got treated and they seem to be okay six or 10 years later, but they're still freaked out every time they go to have a mammogram or um, they're constantly you know, obsessing and worried about getting cancer again or recurrence. So they have been helped tremendously with psilocybin. So they're, they do help. How do they help? We don't know yet. And that might always remain a mystery. I really <laughs> kind of hopes it does. Like we don't have to know everything. We just know that it works. Um, there's lots of um, people, lots of discussions now about neuroimaging and uh, the default mode network part of the brain that um, begins as sort of like a reducing valve. So if if we were aware of everything going on in the world all the time, we would be so totally stressed out and overwhelmed. So that part of our brain is like this valve reduces things so that we can cope with the way the world is and what's going on. Um, and the psychedelics seem to um, open up or open up that valve or open up neural pathways so that uh, we can let go of our, some of our normal defenses and um, have experiences of openness and interconnectedness instead of having to be super protective and defended. So there's theories that are going on out there, but we don't really know how they work. Have to love the mystery, don't we? Mm. And honor that. Yeah. All right, our next question coming from our Facebook group. What are ways to deal with picking up on things like that yourself? And um, to clarify, referring to picking up on the feelings from patients or others in general as an empath, especially. Mm -hmm. So I think this goes back to what we were speaking of earlier. Well, I hope you don't mind. I'll share a story about what happened. Please. We love stories. Yeah. 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 So this, this was a person who um, we were, uh, I think it was maybe the second uh, soul second session. And um, this, I, my hands started burning 
And um, I just felt like it was like a magnet was attracting the palm of my hands to this person's feet. And I just had this strong sense, this person has pain there and needs my hands on, my hands are being attracted to those ankles. And I wrote a note to my co-therapist and said, mm, I think maybe I'll do some body work because this person's feet, I, I just, I just have this intuitive sense. My, my body's telling me to put my hands there. And my wise partner said, they're not asking for it. Uh, in the beginning, the person said, if I need help, I will ask for it. And I, but, but, and I'm furiously scribbling back, you know, but, 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 you know, no, <laughs> just let it go. So I just had to experience my discomfort and my feeling and know that I may or may not be right. I was pretty sure I was right. Person never asked for any help. Um, went, had a very tremendous, uh, impactful, sometimes difficult journey. And the next morning we came back for integration because we come back the next morning after the eight hour day. And uh, this person said, I kind of like to stretch a little bit. Knew I was a yoga teacher. Can you do a little yoga? I said, sure. So we did a little stretching and then stood up to do a very minor uh, tree pose, just, you know, not high up on your leg or anything. And uh, they said, oh, I have really bad ankles. I just, you know, I, I can't do that. I have pain in my ankles all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a confirmation for me that, what I was interpreting was correct. However, I didn't need to do anything about it. So we get into this mode of doing as nurses rather than being with. And I, I learned from that that um, there are things that happened, happened to me emotionally or in my body. And I just allow myself to say, oh, that, that's, that's there. And then let it pass through. If um, it becomes... Uh, very strong. Um, I often will use imagery. So I have an image of um, a golden bubble. And I used to watch this cartoon called the Jetsons when I was a kid, where there's this bubble thing that they have this um, shield that comes down over them. And I think it's to let them go outside and, or into their car or something. But anyways, I just imagine this golden bubble around me, and I'm protected. Or a shield. I love Wonder Woman, this like warrior woman archetype. So I sometimes will imagine that I have a shield, not to beat anybody up or fend them away, but just um, their energy is their energy. Oh, that, that this is what's happening in me. It may or may not be true for them. I might be picking it up from my co-therapist or somebody outside or residual from an interaction I had, um, you know, coming into the session. So if the centered breathing in the beginning or the meditation moments that I take um, don't quell that during the session, then I'll use some imagery, breath work, or like I mentioned before, take a little bit of a break. And um, some people will use salt. They like salt or minerals. Some people use aromatherapy. I'm really careful about aromatherapy because that can trigger some unpleasant things for people, especially if they're sensitive. Um, but uh, hand washing and using visualization has been very helpful. And also getting supervision or um, I have a therapist that I can go and talk to about, about these things to um, kind of process, uh, verbally process. So that and then the artwork or something creative. It doesn't have to be painting or drawing, but some creative endeavor um, after the session. And I just... I've had a lot of practice um, with, particularly with meditation and mindfulness. So I, I implement that during the session if I begin to feel like I'm taking something on from somebody. Oftentimes it's really me, you know, it's a, a worry. I might be worried about something and I'm bringing that into the session. And I think of these medicines as amplifiers. They amplify things not only for the person who's ingested the substance, the whole environment and everybody in it. Mm. So that what you think might be empathing might be your own stuff being amplified. And if you have an awareness practice, it helps you to determine and be able to wait, set that aside, um, be present with, with that situation, that person, set it aside and deal with it later. Excellent. Those are all very helpful. And that story was great. 
Well, we're coming up to close on the end of our time, so we'll take another question. And um, we'll go as long as we can with you folks. And do know that this will be available for you to share with your friends and colleagues. So this comes from Chris Walsack. I hope I said that correctly. And do you think it's important for RNs to have experience with psychedelics to be better working with clients? I have two thoughts about that. Uh, one thought is there is nothing like um, psychedelics to um, help people to understand what the experience might be like. That being said, your experience may be totally different than somebody else's, depending on the medicine, the dose, where you're at, where they're at. Um, I, I think ideally we would get trained as, as um, psychedelic guides or therapists um, with a variety of substances. And um, that being said, I have had some really potent experiences that you might call psychedelic that were without medicine uh, through body work, um, through breath work, either Kundalini or even holotropic breath work and shamanic journeying. They've been super powerful. Some of them have been more significant than the ones that I've had um, with a, a plant medicine. So mm -hmm. I think that you can get there um, to be um, better working with clients, I think was a question. Uh, you can do that uh, without uh, an illegal, taking an illegal substance. But, um, and again, you could take a psychedelic and it, you might not have the um, mentorship or guidance that's um, conducive. You know, we have a pretty controlled setting in the research setting. Um, and so some people that have difficult experiences often come through it um, and are better. But if they were in a group setting, some, some folks I've, I know have been to um, ceremonies, say in Peru, and there was no integration. And so they had a very difficult time. So that would not have helped them at all to work with anybody else. So I think it, it really does depend on the setting and whether you have people that you can trust um, when you take the medicine. Um, I did have a, an experience with MDMA as part of my math therapist training, and that was tremendous. It gave me many insights about stuff that I thought that I had worked on and that needed a little more processing, and also about that type of environment of working um, in a research setting with two guide therapists um, under the influence, uh, both a placebo session, what that was like, as well as under the influence of MDMA. It was very helpful. My hope is that you know, we'll, we'll have more of those training opportunities. And then it helps you to also have insights about, you can ask questions, you know, about how, how does my, how do my nursing abilities and training, uh, how, how, how might that be helpful when I work with clients? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we're at the end of our hour with you, Karen. I want to just express my deep gratitude to you mm -hmm. for all the insights and the wisdom and your, your life story that you've shared with us related to nursing and psychedelics. I know you're a heroine of mine and an inspiration. And you, I look at you as a pioneering trailblazer in this field. And um, I know our audience is so excited to hear from you today. And uh, just uh, really can't thank you enough. I want to invite you, Karen, and all of our guests viewing to join us next month. Annie Mithoffer will be speaking with us. So another wonderful woman working in the field. And we are indeed actually hoping to have Maria Mangini and the nurse who worked on the DMT study in the future. So those are things wonderful. to look forward to with the organization. Before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to share with us today, Karen? I just want to thank you for this opportunity. I'm so excited. I, I I'm really hopeful to have more nurses in this field. I think we have a lot to contribute and to um, just remember to, that uh, you are enough. If, if they say, talk about therapist, um, you're very therapeutic, um, just being a, a health professional. And I, I look forward to, to seeing more nurses in the field. And if there are questions that come up on the chat that you'd like me to answer, um, just ask Elizabeth or people from Open, um, feel free to make a list and I'd be happy to answer those, but I suspect they'll be answered through other presenters as well. 
No, we'll definitely share the questions for you today and um, we'll get back to whom we can in the format that we can. And this will be available on our website and I believe our Facebook and YouTube channel. Great. Thank you. All right. Much love. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.